բարև ձիս հարգելի բարեք ամներս պրկի ձայնը հրուստահանդեսը դարձյալ ձեզ հետ է։ Հարցախյան պատերազմի հենց առաջին որերից ամերիկահայ պաստաբանների միությունը ակտիվ աշխատանքներ We watched as discussions arose almost daily over print, TV, and social media in regards to the illegality of many aspects related to the war. These discussions have not stopped. And so who better for us to approach and get some answers from than the Armenian Bar Association, an association of lawyers and judges of Armenian heritage. Today, we have with us the chairwoman of the Armenian Bar Association, Lucy Varpetian, who is from the West Coast of the United States and a member of the Board of Governors of Armenian Bar Association, one of the leaders of the association's New York, New Jersey, Connecticut chapter, Sudan Israelian from the East Coast. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for joining this Zoom uh, interview. Uh, we cannot wait to get started and hear what the Armenian Bar Association has been doing. So to get started, uh, perhaps for some of our viewers who are not familiar or not very well familiar with the Armenian Bar Association, can you share with us the brief history, purpose, and mission of the association? I, I can jump into that and start with uh, our gratitude for the opportunity to speak um, to the viewers of uh, Voice of Armenians. Um, the Armenian Bar Association was formed in 1989, just before independence. Um, and our uh, association goals, um, it had dual goals, professional growth and advancement of the community. Um, early on, the Armenian Bar Association was instrumental in, the, in developing the rule of law in Armenia. And the one and only time that our mission has changed was in 2015 where we amended our mission to uh, add as one of our primary goals, the recognition of Artsakh. And so for the past five years or so, um, we have worked diligently um, towards that goal. Would you be able to tell us what the association was doing during the war? Uh, immediately after we woke up in the morning of September 27, uh, I'm, I'm sure like everybody else, our hearts dropped when we heard that the Azerbaijan attacked Artsakh and um, within uh, two days we uh, galvanized our troops here, uh, troops meaning the lawyers, uh, uh, Armenian American attorneys in the United States. We called uh, a call for volunteers because we knew, expected uh, and uh, uh, foresaw that a um, lot of legal issues will arise during the war. And uh, we created a number of task forces and um, uh, several hundred attorneys actually, attorneys and law students uh, responded to that call. And we channeled their energies and their talents onto the task forces, the legal issues that were uh, coming up during the war. And our, uh, some of our task forces are still continuing to work actively and uh, will continue well into the future. Our first phone call was on um, September 28th. Uh, through our Armenian Rights Watch Committee, um, we connected with the Ombudsman of uh, Armenia and with Artsakh. And uh, at that point, their first um, comment was, um, the media has a very different narrative of what's happening in the war. And um, they, uh, Azerbaijan over the last uh, multiple years um, had spent a great deal of money in um, creating a, a different narrative about Armenia um, and Artsakh, um, or Artsakh rather being in occupied territories of Azerbaijan. And so, um, and so that was one area of concern that they expressed to us. The other area of concern was that, as you know, there are a number of um, uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, civil societies, um, other ombudsmans around the world, like Amnesty International, like Human Rights Watch, all of these different organizations um, uh, we're turning a blind eye to uh, the plight of the Artsakh people, um, just because Artsakh is an unrecognized country. And uh, 
one of our uh, areas of focus was to uh, reach out to these um, groups, these other organizations and, and agencies, and inform them of what was happening. Uh, and we took it from different perspectives. Um, we uh, engaged uh, uh, non-Armenian organizations that focused on, for example, indigenous rights, religious rights, human rights, civil rights, um, women's rights. Um, and so we really tried to reach out to these uh, organizations, number one, to inform them, to let them know what was going on, and number two, to encourage them to take their own position and to write about what was happening. As you can imagine, a lot of these efforts went unanswered, but uh, we are relentless um, and we uh, have been successful in connecting with a couple of such organizations and um, they themselves have agreed to uh, publish uh, op-eds and to assist with humanitarian aid. Um, of course, we would like to see more, but um, this is the area that Suren is talking about, uh, about the work continuing. So it's not just this um, one part of, uh, you know, um, uh, we don't feel like our work has concluded, but we'll get to some of the other legal areas in a bit, I'm sure. Would you be able to share with us some of the association's task forces um, and what the committees are working on? The other area that we uh, formulated was in the area of um, uh, legal initiatives. Um, we uh, uh, took um, into consideration the different avenues that may potentially be available to Artsakh uh, and Armenia. As you know, uh, all too often when uh, a country is the victim of, um, uh, of such uh, horrific attacks, um, their first area of focus is to provide humanitarian aid. And by virtue of doing that, um, a lot of uh, evidence that can later be presented uh, in court for recovery and recourse is lost and left behind, understandably so. Well, this happened to us during the genocide this happened to us during the Baku and Sumgai pogroms. And um, it's gonna happen to us again um, with uh, all of the uh, people, 90,000 plus fleeing the different areas of uh, Artsakh uh, in a life or de death situation. And so um, we looked number one uh, to uh, put our, um, to, to divide our efforts into different, um, so to speak, buckets. And one area was international tribunals. Another area was US courts. A third area was within uh, United Nations. And a fourth area was with regard to cultural preservation. And so um, we have engaged, as Sudan has said, uh, uh, no fewer than about two to 300 lawyers um, across the country um, uh, and internationally, really, um, to address us uh, and, and do legal research into some of these issues. And we can touch on uh, some of these as we go. Um, did I cover that well, Sudan, or do you want to add something to that? No, um, that's true. Uh, um, and I covered very well. There are also um, um, various task forces, I guess we'll deal with it, that deal with the social media issues which is uh, very important, um, as uh, you all uh, might suspect. We're also working on uh, understanding the legalities and illegalities of the treaties that, uh, of a Karst Treaty and other treaties that affected the legal status of the Armenia, and uh, various other issues uh, in and around uh, Armenia, Armenia, uh, Artsakh, as well as the entire Armenian nation. Our view on when we approach this, this is not a Armenia concentrated, but uh, we want to once and for all break the barrier when we're talking about Armenia and we are talking about Armenian nation and that's one, uh, we are a global nation and that's how we should approach anything and everything. And that's where our strengths are. This is more overarching idea, but we have to put that into a, into an action. And I think that you also bring up 
fantastic points about having to reach out to organizations that are not necessarily Armenian to get as many hands on board as possible. Um, Lucy, you mentioned uh, one of the task forces working with the United Nations. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the issues that you're dealing with in terms of uh, the issues that you're bringing forth uh, towards the United Nations? So not working with the United Nations, but actually working on matters that relate to the United Nations. Late December, a, a small team, uh, and I want to I, I highlight this because very often people think that you have to be a, a seasoned lawyer um, with a very specific area of uh, expertise to uh, work on such matters. This initiative came to us from one of our student members uh, her name's Anush Baldasarian, and she had a very specific vision about um, submitting a, a report to the committee on, it, it's called CERD, Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, she had uh, uh, contacts in, with an NGO in Armenia who had submitted a report in October, and um, she put to together a, a very small group of eight uh, law students and young lawyers, each of whom covered a different aspect of the report, two of them from Argentina, uh, three or four of them from California, um, she's from New York, uh, another from Armenia, and they put together a report that focused on the hate speech um, around the world. And by that, I bring to you the example of um, the, uh, the, the burning of the uh, church in San Francisco, the vandalism and the shooting at the elementary school in San Francisco, um, taking you then to the hate speech that was in um, France in the Lyon region, um, some of the uh, hate speech that occurred in uh, Moscow. And so we reached out as an organization, we reached out to all of those different um, uh, areas where we had uh, friends and colleagues and they, and we all put together, we helped put the, together the, the facts um, uh, of this report together. And ultimately it ended up being a 40 plus page report with very specific um, uh, uh, examples of what had occurred. Um, our uh, newly formed task force on UN initiatives that's led by uh, Yelena Ambarsumyan and Osana Takvorian. Um, they uh, put a great deal of effort behind finalizing the report in the Armenian Bar, was able to submit that report. You can find that on our website um, at armenianbar.org. Um, so those are, that's an example of something that we did um, uh, within the United Nations. In addition, we have uh, members in New York. Um, uh, Grant uh, Petrosian is the secretary of our organization. Palin Sahakian is his law partner. Uh, they are with a law firm, uh, Constantine Cannon, that has um, offices in London where they actually have legal experts uh, in uh, cultural artifacts. And we were able to um, get their input and insight um, in um, helping to prepare for uh, a UNESCO hearing that happened on December 11th. Um, and, um, and some very positive outcomes came from that. Uh, specifically, um, Azerbaijan wanted to push forward one narrative. Of course, Armenia had um, a different narrative. And the uh, hearing body um, adopted Armenia's narrative and rejected in whole Azerbaijan's narrative. So um, very often the work that lawyers do, it is not um, uh, heralded, it's not publicized, it's not shared. Um, we are often in the background and provide support. Um, we often don't even state who our client is or um, the, the type of assistance that we've provided. But um, I'm happy to say that at least in this regard, we were able to do those things and our work continues. Um, as you know, the UN has um, different areas of focus um, having to do with um, terrorism and chemical weapons 
And so we have an eye towards um, being effective in, in those areas as well. So um, part of what we're doing with the UN is uh, creating an accurate record so that in the future, if someone wants to um, bring a challenge or even rely on uh, information, um, then they have a report that they can reference and it's part of their archives and the narrative is corrected. Um, uh, I think, Suren, uh, uh, you'll agree that we've had uh, great challenges with uh, the sheer numbers of uh, people that, um, uh, or, or the information that Azerbaijan and, and Turkey collectively have been able to push out. And just to, for our small people to be able to keep up with putting out, correcting the information has been very difficult. I just want to add maybe three things. Uh, um, and we've done a tremendous amount of work that is somewhat related to the United Nations. But I want to emphasize that we're also very lucky um, that our current ambassador or permanent representative of Armenia to the United Na Nation is uh, Meher Markaryan. And Ambassador Markaryan is, uh, is a great intellectual and uh, a person of passion and, and ability. So that's very helpful that we have a person of that caliber that's representing the Armenia at the United Nations. Having said that, we also have to recognize that the United Nations has a structural flaws. Uh, while we're taking the best possible uh, benefits out of its existing structures, but it's an organization and a grand, huge organization with many agencies and sub-agencies, departments, and so on. It's been created as a result of the World War II, uh, and that's in 1945. And it's, it's not an agile organization. The world has changed. And it's at the time in, uh, in the 20th century, it could have stopped wars. Now it cannot. And there's a lot of atrocities happen in the world under the, um, you know, while United Nations was watching and um, just giving speeches. The time has come for the United Nations to change and for other organizations to be created. And the, our members who are in, intimately involved in some of the work are also looking into those areas as to what is the new organizations of international caliber that actually will meet the challenges of the 21st century and, uh, and the mindset and technologies, because we're in a completely different time period in the human history. And these organizations are so big that they can just simply do not have the flexibility to adjust and come up with the times. However, having said that, it's in a great organization and there's a lot of work, as Lucy said, we have done within it and helping it. And we will continue to do that. Uh, so, you both mentioned uh, the hate speech uh, that we have been seeing around the world, the hate crimes we've been seeing around the world uh, towards Armenian communities in all these different countries. Uh, and that hate speech has inevitably reached the internet. Uh, we are in this new age of technology and there is a piece of the war that has taken upon itself uh, to show itself on social media. And my generation is very active on social media, and we have been seeing this end of the war of the uh, misinformation campaign coming from Azerbaijan and Turkey, um, death threats and threats that Armenians in the diaspora are receiving on social media. So is the Armenian Bar Association looking into any of the issues that affect social media uh, activities? Yeah, I can, um, I can answer that. I think um, uh, early on we said that our uh, legal initiative task force uh, was split into a couple of different areas. The group that's looking at the uh, issues that may relate specifically to the U.S. or within the U.S. Um, uh, one area, and, and in the coming week, uh, uh, you could be on the lookout for a public service announcement that um, we're going to put out to collect information um, specifically about um, death threats, that, uh, threats about um, uh, rape of uh, young Armenian girls, 
um, threats about, you know, we should have finished off what our grandparents started, those kinds of things. And we're going to be collecting data um, because we may be able to look into um, how uh, those how that type of speech can be actionable. Um, one of the areas uh, that I think a different a number of different institutions have looked at, um, and I think the uh, academic study on this is just beginning, is how um, social media um, uh, is used to perpetuate hate that then leads to actual physical violence and then actually leads, leads to genocide. And um, we've seen that in a number of different uh, places. We're also looking at, I think this is maybe a good segue to talk about um, the specifically taking on um, uh, social media uh, companies themselves. So those platforms. Facebook, for example, um, has said that they will not allow for um, uh, denial of Holocaust, but uh, they've said uh, uh, denial of, of genocide, the Armenian genocide, or other genocides is permissible. The only thing I, I want to add to Lucy's point is like with everything else in the law, the people have to understand that the law is a living organism. It's not written in a stone, it's not carved into a stone, and it lives and changes with the changing times. The same thing the same thing with the social media the hate speech aspect of it the bullying that goes on cyber bullying that goes on in a cyberspace those areas are evolving as we speak so the reason we have a task force is um not only studying not only documenting and collecting the evidence but also that we have a role to play in shaping up uh, the laws of the future on these issues. That's all I had, I had to add to Lucy's point. Thank you, Suren. Thank you, absolutely. Uh, and especially in a day and age where uh, technology is, is taking over the narrative and it's very easy to flip the way society thinks of a certain situation. Uh, if, if someone has more people online, more people on social media posting misinformation and posting this uh, propaganda, it is going to inevitably impact how uh, the public is seeing what is going on in Armenia. Um, and so it's really good to hear that although gradual, because that's the only way that we're gonna get work done, uh, we are working towards rectifying some of these new issues that have come up. Uh, so another question that I wanted to ask, is the Armenian Bar Association looking into the issues dealing with some of the investments, uh, a property uh, that was owned by Armenian, Amer Armenian Americans in Artsakh that is now under Azeri control or that has been damaged or uh, destroyed? Yeah, so this is again another one of our um, task forces. It's the uh, International um, Tribunals Task Force that's looked at a number of different uh, areas. The challenges here is that um, depending on um, whether Armenia is a signatory to a particular convention, it can or cannot um, take advantage of, of the laws that are available in certain tribunals. And that ultimately becomes the, the, the decision maker or the, the driving force. And some of these actions have to be brought by the government of Armenia. Um, but you know, people say, well, what can individuals uh, do? And this is also um, uh, driven by the types of treaties that now Azerbaijan has entered into with other Western countries, for example, the United States or with France. There are investment treaties that Azerbaijan has entered into with um, the United States, for example, um, with the intention of uh, protecting the uh, investments of these foreign investors. And um, for example, if you uh, are a um, citizen of the United States, and you went to um, Artsakh and you invested in a business, 
um, or you invested in property. And now though that business or those properties are in jeopardy because they have been, they are now occupied by Azerbaijan. Well, you may have uh, rights uh, pursuant to the treaty between the United States and Azerbaijan. And the Armenian Bar Association really wants people to be knowledgeable of this um, because at the end of the day, uh, those investors have to take some affirmative steps to protect their investments. We've put out a public service announcement um, uh, so that people will become better informed, better aware, and will take the necessary steps in uh, protecting and preserving the rights that they have. If, uh, if they're uncertain, they can certainly send an email uh, to the Armenian Bar at info at armenianbar.org. We would just encourage people to become better informed uh, about what, what opportunities and what uh, resources are available to them. I just uh, uh, want to emphasize that that's a very important uh, aspect of it for people to be aware of it. This is one of our task forces. We have multiple task forces and when the task force matures and the legal Imagine our task forces like laboratories, where the lawyers come together, they put their heads together, they figure out, analyze the claims, the defenses, and everything else in between. And then when it already matures that we can share with the public, that is when you see our public service announcements, PSAs. And that is for the people to be aware of it, that such a claims can be commenced against the Azeri government. Uh, we are uh, we are gonna have another uh, PSA as uh, Lucy earlier mentioned coming up perhaps later this coming week, and uh, but be uh, aware, of, uh, watch out for this PSA because they're critically important. There's things we in a PSA we cannot say. You have to read between the lines, but overall it's basically to advising the public of what actions can be taken against the Nazari government or Azeri Turkish interests. And I think maybe to even um, highlight some of that or to get a little bit more in depth, um, some of these then become, uh, take the form of a discussion or a webinar through Zoom. We put that information uh, out through um, our, our Facebook page, our, our website, and we're really hopeful that um, Ms. Kocharyan here will also uh, assist us in uh, disseminating some of that information. Um, ultimately, it, it comes down to people being informed. And I'll give you um, sort of an example. Um, when, the, when the statement uh, was signed, um, everyone was outraged that uh, Dadi Bank was going to be turned over. People saying that they were going to um, start removing khachkas and start removing um, frescoes and these types of things. Um, by publicizing that, they may in fact be violating international law. And so, um, yes, it's, it feels tragic because as we know what happened in, uh, to the khachkas of Julfa in Nakhichevan, um, but at the same time, we cannot be advocating breaking the law. We just want to make sure that people understand that there are laws that protect these uh, artifacts um, and they should be comporting themselves um, legally. Um, so uh, a, a lot of what we try to do is inform the public, um, one, so that they don't break the law, but secondarily to make sure that they don't um, leave something behind that they may be entitled to. I'm, I'm glad that you brought up that specific example because uh, something that I know a lot of Armenians are wondering is if these cultural artifacts are protected under international law, how does that international law impact them being protected from Azeris destroying them uh, as being part of Azerbaijani land and wanting to get rid of Armenian culture and heritage and cultural sites. So I think that speaks to the uh, example we talked about um, with regard to the UNESCO hearing that was on December 10th and 11th. Um, part of the result of that hearing 
was to um, uh, uh, send a mission to um, to uh, look at and document and um, offer protection to those cultural artifacts. Um, and I think, uh, you know, this may be a good time to, to mention that um, not just the Armenian Bar Association, but the entire um, Armenian nation around the world, every organization um, has uh, risen as uh, one people to offer their area of expertise and assistance. We have pay, played a very small part. Anytime any organization has asked for um, uh, legal expertise in a particular area, for example, um, uh, shipping um, uh, prescription medicine um, that is regulated under export uh, control laws. Um, and so, it, you know, the, the various organizations that have reached out to ask for collaboration and assistance, we have done our small part. Um, so we've worked very closely with, for example, the Armenian American Medical Society, the Armenian Engineers and Scientists Association. Um, Sudan mentioned the uh, other international um, uh, lawyers groups uh, out of France, Great Britain, um, uh, a great body of work out of uh, Canadian lawyers who put together a, a brief for Artsakh's recognition for their own parliament. But um, specific to your question with regard to the preservation of, of artifacts, little did we know that um, in, in, dur during this process, a very strong uh, group of um, art historians and art experts uh, were also gathering their own troops, gathering their own uh, colleagues, Armenian and non-Armenian, who really have an appreciation and a, and a motivation for protecting uh, cultural artifacts and history. And almost immediately, uh, I'd like to say sometime on November 11th or 12th, they were already working with the cultural ministries of Armenia and with Artsakh, and they were on the ground with um, trying to document 3D images of um, what was there so that they could then have a record of, hopefully, you know, they continue to be there, but in case they weren't there. And, um, and again, you know, as with all these different areas, um, there, it, it touches the law somehow. And so we were very happy to be able to play one small part in um, providing them with uh, uh, assistance in international law. Anijan, your question is a very important one. Why if uh, on one side we obey the law, on the other side we have a people um, who really don't care about the law and they destroy the artifacts, what is the remedy? Uh, and here's, I guess, where it, uh, my point came earlier when I was talking about the United Nations. And just in generally, the business of the law uh, is to provide redress for the wrongs. A wrong is being committed against the Armenian nation time and time, and there was no redress. It's still, uh, we're still asking for justice. But this is where it comes that international institutions have actually failed to provide the effective mechanisms for a real redress that the lawbreakers such as Azerbaijan and others, uh, that they didn't see, uh, they didn't see the penalty, they didn't feel the penalty or the penalty was a pinprick. So, we have to, that's why we're working as a group or coalition of our, uh, Armenian lawyers here in the United States and working and cooperating with uh, Armenian lawyers and Armenian legal groups throughout the world to actually change those. Because all you can see here, changing the topic, uh, uh, all you hear is Azerbaijan is talking about that they're gonna commence some kind of a lawsuit against Armenia for. $50 billion, um, I just want to tell your listeners, it's absolute nonsense. But it does not necessarily mean that they will not do it. 
they will they can do it and there is but they will lose the issue is what we have to what we're working on are the real lawsuits that are not gonna be lost that have a valid basis and some of them we have predicaments because international legal standards international laws are provides loopholes for a government to destroy uh, heritage such as the destruction of the Julfa cemetery to escape responsibility but our list of damages of Armenian nation from the blockade of early 1990s from a destruction and uh, of the infrastructure uh, of uh, that provided source of supply of energy and food for Armenia in 1990s to the Julfa cemetery and the list goes on and it's not a $50 billion, it goes into the trillions of dollars. Uh, so that's what at issue. What they're trying to flip the, uh, what the Azeri, and I'm not even sure if Azeri is doing it, I highly suspect that somebody that they hire does it, uh, somebody that is, uh, knows how to play those games, is that they try to flip the game. They try to say, oh, we're gonna sue the Armenia. They have no basis in the, uh, ever to sue Armenia. Uh, this brings up another question. Uh, I'm wondering how can we ensure that what the Azeris did to Nahichevan, uh, the occupation of this land and the destruction of hundreds of Armenian cultural sites does not happen again this year to the lands that Azerbaijan has taken from Artsakh. And uh, whether that's uh, just working more closely with UNESCO and, and pushing them to really uh, put their people on the ground and make sure that these cultural sites are protected. I mean, does that look, look different than what you're doing now? Are there more efforts that um, need to be highlighted? I do not know if there's any way we can, uh, if they wanted to do it, we can uh, prevent them to do it. They cannot escape responsibility for it if they do it. And that responsibility doesn't only attach to the government of Azerbaijan, but attaches to individuals and everybody in the chain of command. The responsibility for committing those kind of crimes, which is crimes against humanity, is attaches to the personally. They should be watching their back left and right when they walk in the, on this earth, if they do it. Uh, so that's all we can just basically tell them. The law will catch up with them eventually, whether he, now, tomorrow, 10 years or 25 years from now. We have no qualm with the uh, good people in Azerbaijan or good people in Turkey. It's not with them. It's with their leadership that uh, preaches hate toward Armenia and everything Armenians. By the way, I just want to also stress that uh, we have a great advantage in the world. And that advantage is we have a lot of non-Armenians that are, understand our, our struggles much more than they will ever sympathize with uh, Azerbaijan or Turkey or their interests. Their interests are very specific, usually related to the wealth of the energy and otherwise. But our causes, our, uh, uh, our fights and our pursuits are more just and we have a much more strong coalitions and it's, uh, it's the time for us to actually build these coalitions to a different levels. Uh, sometimes you don't want yeah, you want other people to fight and pick up the uh, weapons for you. And, uh, you know, this is uh, metaphorically speaking, we're not picking up any weapons, but sometimes other people that feel very strongly about the issues that are affecting Armenians will speak and should speak. All of this information is extremely helpful to people who don't know what the Armenian Bar Association is doing. And I think the question a lot of uh, diasporans have is what can we do, what can my generation do to not only assist Armenian Bar Association in your very valuable uh, and, and uh, 
heart wrenching and, and time time wrenching work that you do. But how can we help Armenia right now? Ani, I think the the first thing um, that your generation can do is stay Armenian, learn Armenian, um, be involved. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what kind of work you do. Listen to Armenian music, uh, advance Armenian culture, participate in Armenian politics. Uh, visit Armenia as often as you possibly can. Be informed and be engaged. Um, you know, all of these things that Sudan and I do uh, are for naught. If there's no one else to pick up um, uh, where we uh, uh, leave things. And um, much of the the Haire Nasirutun and much of the, um, the uh, motivation that I have uh, came to me from my father. I was nine years old when I moved to the United States and he would uh, uh, force me to read the Armenian paper so I wouldn't forget what little I had learned in the second grade. And to this day, I know how to read, I know how to write, but it's a greater challenge for your generation who may have been born here. And so to the extent that you can, as Silva Kaputikian would say, you know, don't forget your Armenian language. Don't forget your Armenian tongue um, and be involved as often as you can. Attend meetings, go to whatever it is that your motivation is, do it. Participate, be active, be engaged. Fantastic. Uh, and, a, and a quick uh, question. Can non-lawyers become members of the Armenian Bar Association or is this legal professionals only? We welcome everyone. Fantastic. I'm sure many people will be very happy to hear that uh, and see how we can help you. Thank you. And where can we find uh, the reports that you were discussing and learn more about uh, the Armenian Bar Association's activities and current events? Um, we, we try to, uh, and it's a lot to keep up, but we try to put everything and catalog everything under our media Artsakh tab uh, on our website. Our website is armenianbar.org. We are a nonprofit organization. Um, uh, we try to push out a lot of information on our Twitter account, on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on our YouTube channel. So somehow you're going to be touched by us if you um, have the inclination to, um, to, to join. Um, yeah, so that's the, the quickest way to do it. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you, Sudan, so much for joining me today and answering all of these questions. Your work is so valuable and I know that I speak for the entire Armenian community both in Armenia and the diaspora uh, in saying thank you for everything that you do uh, and all the hard work that you put into ensuring that we will receive the justice um, that our people deserve. Thank you. My name is Craig Fair, and I am the special agent in charge of the FBI San Francisco Division. The FBI is the federal law enforcement agency responsible for defending the civil rights of all people in the United States. We are committed to protecting the First Amendment rights of everyone in our communities, including the free exercise of religious beliefs. I am standing here in front of St. Gregory, the Illuminator Armenian Apostolic Church in San Francisco, to talk to you about the arson that was set here which threatened the civil rights of our local community. On September 17, 2020, at approximately 4.15 a.m., an unidentified arsonist set fire to the church's administration building, which housed offices, a library, and a Sunday school. The building sustained significant fire, smoke, and water damage. Thankfully, no one was injured. However, this act of violence was not just an attack on a building, but on a congregation. This was an attack on a community. The FBI is assisting the San Francisco Police Department in the ongoing investigation into this arson. We have been collecting evidence and following leads, but we need the public's help to solve this crime. The FBI and SFPD are seeking the public's assistance in identifying the arsonist responsible for this attack. Today, I am announcing that the FBI is offering a reward of up to $50,000 for information leading to the identification, arrest, and conviction of the individual or individuals responsible for this arson. We are counting on assistance from members of the community to keep our city safe. Every lead will be thoroughly investigated. 
regardless of how insignificant you think your information might be, we strongly encourage you to come forward and we welcome your information and assistance. The FBI takes all acts or threats of violence seriously and is committed to investigating crimes that are potentially hate motivated. We also have jurisdiction to investigate fires set at houses of worship under the Church Arson Prevention Act of 1996. Our civil rights cases are among the most important work we do. We are aware of other criminal acts this year that have targeted San Francisco's Armenian community. At this time, we do not know if these incidents are related to the arson at St. Gregory. On July 24th, hateful graffiti was discovered at San Francisco's KZV Armenian School. On September 19th, gunshots were fired at the school. We urge the public to come forward if you have any information on any of these incidents. If you have any information, please contact the San Francisco Police Department or contact FBI San Francisco at 415-553-7400 or tips.fbi.gov. Tips can remain anonymous. Thank you for your assistance.